The victims of the opioid crisis are not just parents, they're children. And the number of them who need a new home from abuse or neglect has skyrocketed over the last few years. So listen to this. The Buffalo News did an in-depth study of just one small county. They found that hundreds of children had to be sent out of the state, all because there were too few places for them to live locally. Alex Miller joins us tonight. Uh, Alex, you've been working on a special report for us, uh, looking in-depth and behind the scenes of the foster care system. And you found that over the last few decades, it's improved in many ways. But the opioids epidemic, that has just ravaged it. Yeah, it's made the demand increase so much more than we've seen in decades. And part of the problem is that these counties, like the one, like Erie County uh, that the Buffalo News studied, it, they can't take care of the kids themselves because there's just such high demand. And in some cases, these kids are having to move from state to state. So unless people step up and take in these kids, they're going to be moving, separated from their siblings, uh, to make sure they find a safe home. Foster care has been around pretty much forever. The earliest instances can be related back to the Torah and the Bible. The colonies had their own version of the foster care system. Poor children were taken in, but as indentured servants. Almost 70 years later, in 1636, the Jamestown colony got rid of indentured servant children and had its first official foster child, seven-year-old Benjamin Eaton. It would take almost 200 more years in 1853 for the foster care movement to really begin. The program was originally started because of parental death, not abuse and neglect as we see today. Social agencies began to pay and supervise foster parents in the early 1900s. That put the program on the government's payroll. Today's foster care system is broken into three categories. Single family, meaning one or two parents host up to six kids in their home. Group homes house more than six children. They're subject to a number of federal regulations, all in an effort to prevent abuse. And finally, kinship care. A relative or familiar person takes care of the child. This, of course, is the most ideal placement. Most times, Child Protective Services will try to keep the child in the home and work with the families through various issues. In the event a child is taken out of the home, parents are also provided support so they may gain custody back eventually. In the end, Child Welfare says the goal is always to reunite families. So the goal is always to reunite these families, and a lot of times that does happen, more than half the time, and that's because they're smaller issues, like a parent got into a car accident or they need to be evaluated, and then these kids can go back home. That's good. But in the event that it doesn't, they need to be moved into a safe environment, and that doesn't always happen. And so I talked to one man who decided to get involved with the foster care system just out of his teen years. Let's take a listen. Jackson Farmer is spending his Friday night like most teenage boys, playing video games. But his Friday nights weren't always this relaxing. I wasn't being taught the right things by my parents. Jackson spent years in an unstable home and then foster care before finally being adopted by Barry Farmer six years ago. I just felt like this was home. For the first few years, it was just Jackson and Barry. And that was on purpose. Like within any of the other foster families, like I just didn't, I just didn't feel right there. Like I started off with siblings, and they didn't really, you know, like me. But then I came here as the only child. Plus, Barry was young himself. He became a foster parent at only 20. He says his own experiences in the system inspired him to foster right away. The parent role. It was natural for me, so I didn't think of my age as being something that should stand in my way if I really wanted to do it. Still, there was an unexpected learning curve. So I had to reach out to some of my friends who were white to let me know how I should, you know, parent him, how I should take care of his um, cultural needs, his skin, his hair. I, you know, I didn't know where to take him to get his hair cut. <laughs> I knew that we were different, but that was the only thing that was different about us was our skin. But the family worked because Barry wanted to learn for his first son. And when Jackson started asking for a brother, Barry opened up his home again, this time to Xavier and again to Jeremiah. We have to start over. It's like a newborn. The boys all came to Barry from different situations. Jackson from a foster family, Xavier from a group home, and Jeremiah at only four years old as a respite foster care. The varying situations made for a trying transition. It's hard to do to move forward sometimes. You still want about 
the trauma. It's about the, uh, the emotional roller coaster that they have been on for maybe a year or so or more. And put yourself in their shoes, basically, and say that it's, it's okay. Then it's not, a, it's not to hurt your feelings. We're just scared. Right? Now, they're just like any other family. They get along just like brothers. They will fight, and then you, if you try to separate them, they will, well, it, we're okay. Jackson says it's not always easy, but it's always worth it. Adoption is good, and that you shouldn't be afraid to adopt. Because, like, even though it might start off rough at the beginning, when, like, it gets right and then he becomes, he or she becomes successful, you can say, I did that. I mean, they are really well-adjusted, cute, uh, thoughtful kids, it seems like, you know, that they have come into this environment after all of this hardship, and they're saying, this is now our family. That's awesome. It really is. They kind of gelled together. They said this isn't what they thought was going to happen, but it happened organically, and they're on board with it. Thankfully, they've had a good experience. Um, other foster children, sometimes they can have a bad experience. Barry told you because they get traumatized when they realize this is my life now. Yeah, so the goal of foster care is always reunification. So these kids are put on this path, even in foster care, that they're going to at some point go back with their family member, uh, whether it's their parents or some sort of relative. And when that changes, they have to readjust their focus to know that they have a new normal and a different future. Um, and for a lot of those kids, it's really difficult. His middle son, Xavier, was living in a group home. So that's six or more kids. So even just coming into his home was such an adjustment because he had to learn what a family unit was like because he'd been there for so long and he was you know not that old when he went into his family so he said the message basically is that when kids have these behaviors and they're acting out it's less to do with the foster parent and you've got to just be patient and know that they're working through some traumas that you might not even know about they don't have the emotional or verbal tools to express it so their behavior might be different than other kids yeah he said it was really interesting because jeremiah came to him when he was four years old and obviously they're not related but he still says he has to explain to him over and over again because he's been with him so long that to him that is the only dad he's known and barry was 20 when he started this process 20 years old